It's been a wonderful, wonderful day today, hasn't it? It just, um, the little boy said it gets gooder and gooder. I like that. Well, we have been uh, sort of doing a series of messages, uh, and we've been centering around the theme of hope. And I want to invite you back next week, because next week is going to be a special service. We've never done one here before. Uh, it's kind of combining our Christmas service and our uh, kind of the winter solstice service together. And we're calling it a blue Christmas service. And as you know, uh, this will be uh, coming up the 21st of December is known as winter, winter solstice. It's the longest night of the year. But along with that, uh, it, we're reminded of how many people still live in darkness. And even of those people who, who know the truth, uh, there's all kinds of things that go on in their lives. Um, you know, people suffering, they've lost loved ones. We have people in our church today, and, and, I, and I'm so thankful to see Brenda and Melinda both with us today and some of the others here today that have recently lost loved ones. People going through relationships and, and all kinds of things. Uh, it's just a tough time of year, and so we recognize that. We don't want to uh, dwell on those things, but we want to recognize that at this time of year that we are not there yet, that there is still violence in the world. There's still darkness in the world. And so we have not yet arrived, and so we kind of took this as a journey. And we talked about, you know, uh, finding Christ and, and, and on this journey, finding hope on this journey. And today the theme is finding hope in the desert. Next week, the theme for our Blue Christmas is finding hope in the darkness. And I hope you can be here for that. But we come to the place today, we've been sort of looking at John the Baptist and his, um, his character uh, is a little different than most people would uh, find in uh, church today. And uh, so, John the Baptist was, was a an, an unique individual. He was probably one of the Essenes, which was a strict group of almost like monks who dwelt in the desert. And they ate whatever they could find. They, you know, they would be the people today that, that live off the grid. Well, John the Baptist lived off the grid. He didn't dress the religious dress. He didn't talk the religious talk. He probably would not fit in at most Christmas parties, Beth. But he was a person who was looking at the forerunner of Christ. And so he was born uh, really with the purpose of uh, preparing the way for Jesus Christ. And so John the Baptist uh, was down one day uh, at the river. And he went down there, uh, was baptizing people, and he had to... Uh, had all kinds of people coming out listening to him. He was a unique character. And he preached with fire and he was down there. And, and so as he's down there at the river, he's beginning to, uh, to tell people what they needed to do in order to get themselves right and ready for God. And he sounded something like this. <laughs> But him who's coming after me, he's so much 
think John the Baptist sounded exactly like that. And that's why I asked him to come today. And what he was saying is right out of the Bible. Because John the Baptist told those that were coming just to be seen, those that were coming uh, who thought that because they were sons of Abraham that they could just walk right into the kingdom of God without any kind of proof. And as you've heard, he, they, he said, I want you to bring me proof, fruits to show that you are genuine today. And, uh, and so it was a very, very serious thing. And so as they did this and they, they began to talk about this, uh, John the Baptist, uh, as I said, you know, he had a lot of uh, followers and he began to have people uh, come to him to be baptized. And so he is down there at the river, and all these people were coming. And I, I think of that scene in the, the movie, Old Brother, Why Are Out There, when they're walking out in those white robes, and they're uh, singing the songs and the praises of God. And, you know, when we used to uh, baptize people in the creek and the rivers, uh, when, when I remember growing up, and we'd sometimes break the ice, and we'd sing, uh, you know, those songs, uh, you know, As Shall We Gather at the River? you know, and, and baptize somebody. And so all these people are coming to be baptized. And here comes Jesus to John to be baptized by John. Hold on. I'm sorry, Jesus, I didn't see you standing over there. Look here, y'all. This is the one I was telling you about. This here is God's land. This is the one I was talking about when I said there was somebody coming out me who somehow has gotten ahead of me because he was here before I was. And let me tell you something, Jesus. That's a pretty good trick. <laughs> well, all right, Jesus. It's time for the dipper to get dipped. Yeah, all right. And so that day, John didn't want to be uh, baptized in Jesus. He felt like he should be the one baptized. But Jesus said no. Please allow this to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus, the one who was sinless, went down into that, as I heard an old preacher call it, the watery grave. I like that. The watery grave. Jesus went down into that watery grave, not because he was sinful, but to fulfill righteousness and to initiate himself with God and open up his ministry. And this began his ministry at that day. Well... John goes on, and, and you know, John was not one to just let things lie. He was a person who, uh, if he saw something wrong, he spoke up about it. And he wasn't, you know, uh, shall I say, he didn't, he didn't beat around the bush about it. And so here he comes across Herod, and finds out that Herod's just living all kinds of life, and Herod's just not living right and not doing what he should do. And Herod gets uh, John sees him down somewhere by the river or somewhere and he confronts him about having his brother's wife. Herod, you son of a snack. It was good enough for you to roll around in bed with your brother's wife. You got up and married her. And now, oh, now son, you are going straight back to the jackass. Do not pass go. Do not let two hundred dollars more full of sin and a tick what's been a sucking all So, thank you, John. That's about the size of it. Well, guess what happened after that? Anybody want to take a guess? John gets what? Gets thrown in prison. And that didn't turn out too well for him either, did it? Because he ends up being beheaded. We're not going to do that part. But... Uh, <clears throat> So, here's John in prison. Ron read the passage today. And what he expected to happen didn't happen. He expected Jesus to come, of course, to set up his kingdom, and they would rule and reign, and everything would be great. End of story. But that's not what happened. John is preparing the way for the Messiah, and instead of being on the front line of the battlefield, he ends up in the stocks of a cold dungeon. 
And there he is sitting in jail, and he has time to think. And you know, when you're alone, you have time to think about things. You get things on your mind. And he starts to wonder, wait a minute. Could I have been wrong about this person? Was I too soon to announce the coming of the Messiah? Because this is not what I thought the Messiah would be. He doesn't ride, a ride, horse. He doesn't ride on a white horse. He, he's not coming with a sword in the spirit of power. Who is this meek person? And it looks like there's people turning against him, and now it looks like I'm going to lose my life. And I want to tell you that in that prison that John began to have his own self-doubts and, and to begin to wonder if maybe this was the time or not, if this was the person or not. And so he sends forth people to ask Jesus, are you the one that should come, or should we look for another? And Jesus tells them, go back and tell John the things that you've seen and heard of me, the works that I do. The eyes of the blind have been opened. The lame walk. And the dead have been raised again, risen again. And so you want to tell him that. And they go back and John has to hear those words and understand that this is who he said he was. And John was willing <coughs> at that point. I think he was willing to put his life on the, on the altar. Literally beheaded for Jesus. And I don't know if you and I I don't know if you've ever been there. Maybe you've never been to that, that point of desperation. But sometimes in life, when you think things are going to go one way, and they turn out a different way. You had a plan for your life. You had a plan for your, uh, for your job. You had a plan for your family. You have all these plans, and you think, this is the way things are going to turn out. And then all of a sudden, everything seems to just, the bottom just seems to fall out. And you don't know what's going on. Then you begin to second-guess yourself and maybe even second-guess God and say, Lord, what in the world is going on? One day I'm walking around and everything is fine, and the next thing you know I'm flat on my back. Or I'm falling on my face, and I'm picking up the pieces of my life, and I don't even know where to turn anymore. And you get to that place in your life where you just... If you're real honest with God, I know us good, honest church folks here, as he was talking about, don't like to admit that we ever have a doubt. We don't want to admit that we ever question God. And we don't want to admit that there's never ever been a time in our life when we're lying there in the quiet of the darkness and thinking to ourselves, what's going on, God? Where is God right now? in my suffering? Where is God in my desperation? Where is God in my disillusionment? And maybe it's just a moment of a thought, but that's where John was. Sometimes all it takes is to pick up the Bible and read the book again, or to hear those words of Jesus once again, and to realize God is still on the throne. He's still God. He's still real. He's still in our life. And he still loves you no matter what you're going through. And I see people all the time that are suffering and on their deathbed or they're losing loved ones. And I have to tell you, I can't promise you that your life is going to be a bed of roses. I wish I could. I can't make everything better, but I can promise you this, that Christ said he would never leave you. He will never forsake you. He'll go with you through the fire and through the flood and through all the things that you go through the life. Even when everyone turns their back on you, he never will. He'll be with you. He'll be your friend. I'm so glad today that I have a God who's on the throne and he knows what's going on. And sometimes it may seem like that the world is turning upside down, but I promise you, he's still on the throne. He's still God. He's still in control. Now, he's allowing the devil to run rampant right now for a little while, and that's temporary. But we read last week about a time when the lion will lay down with the lamb, and the child shall lead them. A time of peace and prosperity. Are we there yet, church? No. We're not there yet, but we're on a journey, 
And I hope you're on this journey with us. Because we're going someplace that the kingdom of God will be eventually. And what John was looking for, and what the disciples were looking for, will be fulfilled. They just didn't realize it was going to take a while because the people of God, the Jews, did not repent. They just did not understand what Jesus was all about. And sometimes what stands between you and what stands between me is our own pride and not being able to say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, and I need help. I need Jesus. And so today, if you've been in that valley, if you've been in that desert, if you've been disillusioned with life, I want to encourage you today to join us on this journey of faith together. I want to ask you to bow your heads as the musician comes. We're going to get a song. Let's, let's pray. Father, today, what a privilege it is to be able to proclaim your word. Lord, in the times of our life when we feel disillusioned, when we feel afraid, when we have doubts, even anger and frustration, God, that we can be reminded that you still love us, that you still have a plan. And Lord, it may not always turn out the way we expected it to, but we know in the end it will turn out exactly the way it's supposed to. So today we pray for each and every one here for the struggles that they may have. If there's any here, Lord, that's not following you, I pray that they would. I pray this would be a day of change in their hearts, in their minds, in their lives, in their walks. And today I pray your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to get a song and ask you to stand, but I also want you to know today that you can come and pray anywhere up here. We've got plenty of room. And we'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you after church. We'll stay with you and tell you how you can know this Jesus that we've been talking about.